hope you all are doing well. We will continue on with the gas law chapter. And this section is really where chemistry started. And I think this is kind of an interesting thing because when you talk about gases, they're very hard to contain, yet this is kind of where the ideas of chemistry really solidified, which is kind of cool. Um, if you took the exam yesterday, uh, and if you're gonna take it today or tomorrow, cool. I am still on target for returning the exams this Friday in lecture, if all goes well, so we'll do that then. But in the meantime, let's go back and see kind of about where chemistry turned from alchemy in to the science it is. And we're going to start off with a very practical application of this, and that's airbags. And airbags, I really believed, uh, saved my sister one time in an accident. She was in a bad car wreck, and the airbag kind of saved her. Um, airbags have different mechanisms, but what happens is there's a bag that fills usually with nitrogen gas, something pretty mellow, that then buffers you as you hit the other parts. Usually it's a sodium azide reaction. Azide is a polyatomic ion with an N3 minus one. And when it's disturbed, you end up making quite a bit of nitrogen gas. This is the main force of it. You also make some sodium, which has its own thing, but uh, just be careful. Wonderful, the sound is not working. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's gonna be one of those days, I don't see that coming. Okay, let's try that again. <clears throat> In a collision involving a car equipped with airbags, the impact initiates a chemical reaction. Automobile airbags work when a sample of sodium azide detonates, producing nitrogen gas. This gas fills the bag. Using our understanding of the gas laws, we can calculate the quantity of sodium azide required to produce the appropriate amount of nitrogen gas. So creating the gas from a solid is a big part of chemistry, but also making sure that the balloon deploys well enough to protect the person is another part of it. We need to know about the volume of the gas created and things like that. So this is a pretty cool chapter. And of course, you're breathing gas in right now, and that shouldn't be underestimated either. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. We're starting a period now of study where we're going to look at the different phases of matter. And the kinetic molecular theory, the KMT, is what scientists use to describe it. And solids are very tightly packed together. Uh, liquids have more of a flexible kind of orientation. And gases really have no interaction whatsoever. So in this next section, we're going to definitely focus on gases. And in the next section or two, we'll focus more on these and how you can turn like a liquid into a gas or a gas into a solid, stuff like that. Um, when you think about a gas, I think this is kind of obvious, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Obviously, there's a lot of free space in a gas. Um, if you look at me, like right now, you can see me, but if you were to look through like water, which is clear, it wouldn't be quite the same. Uh, there's more mass per unit volume in uh, water than there is in a gas, and so there's a lot of differences. Um, you can expand gases as much as you want. You can fill any container, and after a very small amount of time, usually, the gas is evenly distributed. So the gas at the top would be the same as the gas at the bottom. And if you take two gases and you put them together, they usually come together and mix pretty readily. And that's different from like liquids. Um, if you try and mix like uh, two liquids together, a lot of times you have to stir them up to make them mix. It takes a lot longer. And that has to do a little bit with less uh, gas per volume and stuff, but we'll see. The densities of gases are quite different than the densities of liquids too, and that's something we'll see. Gas in one of these balloons, so if any of them pops, they may die. No, April, we would all die. Gases fill the volume of whatever container they're in. School. 
<laughs> so I apologize for this silly thing, but anyway, they're trying to have a celebration and stuff, and they think that if it's just one balloon, it's going to pop. No, the gas is mixed together, and if the gas was truly toxic and stuff, then it would kill everyone. All right, that's kind of dark, I guess. Anyway, you can model <laughs> gases really well with math, and it's not very difficult math to do either, which is kind of cool. So if you want to know how much the balloon will expand or how much gas will come out, it's pretty readily available. And in when you're thinking about gases, you have to think about things that we're going to think about in lab this week. And one of them is the volume of the gas, like how much volume is it going to take, a lot of volume or a small amount? the volume, and that might depend on the container that it's in. It's going to depend on the temperature, all right? Warmer temperatures make the gases a little different than colder temperatures. By the way, these are the units that are going to be often associated with these pieces, so volume will often be in liters. Temperature will just about always be in Kelvin when we're doing math, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, the amount of gas is important, so we have a little or a lot, it makes a big difference, and of course moles is where chemists usually go with that. The quantity, the symbol usually for moles is N, so if you see N in this chapter, it's going to be moles. And the new player on the block in this chapter, which we'll talk about a little bit in lab two, is the pressure of the gas. Now, pressure is an entity unto itself, but the unit of pressure that we usually in chemistry use is called the atmosphere. It gets the abbreviation ATM. So if you see ATM, it doesn't mean, you know, get out your bank card. It means it's a value of pressure, and the value of the atmospheres can go up and down. Pressure is just as important to scientists as like temperature is. And in Chem 221 and uh, Chem 222, we've talked about temperature. The pressure is really important, but it is mostly for gases. And this guy named Torricelli, an Italian scientist, in 1643 created what they feel is the first barometer. So while a thermometer measures temperature, a barometer measures pressure. And the, val the, the, the standard version, if you will, of a barometer that's used today, it usually uses mercury, and we'll see why in a little bit. Um, all around us all the time, the atmosphere is pushing on us. And you can think about it like gas has mass, and mass is affected by gravity. So the gravity is pulling all of these gas molecules down around us all the time. And you can measure uh, different vacuums and pressures this way. Uh, the pressure pushes down, and mercury is affected by this. Uh, it will actually go up a column with a vacuum inside. And people started to realize that as the temperature outside changed, or storms came in and left, the value, the height of a column like this would go up and down. Now, if you do this right, you have to have, you know, the right column width, and you have to have a vacuum and stuff like that. However, it is a relatively easy thing to do, and um, you can get electronic versions now of all these things. So in lab now, we're actually using the little blue box, which is an electronic version. Vacuum means theoretically no molecules in it? Yeah, that's right, that's right. It's zero pressure, or pretty close to, for our purposes right now. I had like a so-so date with Valerie, now I'm number nine on the speed dial. So? So, I used to be seven. I dropped two spots. What, she's ranking you? Yeah, the speed dial is like a relationship barometer. What is a barometer exactly? It's pronounced thermometer. <laughs> so you can see the looks they gave each other. Now you know for sure that thermometer measures temperature and a barometer measures pressure. All right, so pressure and temperature are different things. All right. Uh, around pressure has developed the idea of what's referred to as a standard atmosphere. And the idea is, is that an atmosphere is the standard common pressure that you would experience if you were right at the ocean. So zero level, a zero feet elevation, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of relationships to what an atmosphere is. And we're going to be converting different kinds of units to the atmosphere so we can use it. So an atmosphere is equal to a lot of different things. And mathematically, what we'll do a lot is we'll have millimeters of mercury pressure. 
And if you want to convert that to an atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury equals an atmosphere. We used to record pressures um, at Mount Hood in millimeters of mercury, but our barometer uh, in 2506 actually fell off the wall one time. Mercury went everywhere. So instead of going back through that nightmare and cleaning that up, uh, we decided to do an electronic version. However, you see a lot of these mercury barometers, and the height is literally like how high it goes. And again, the mercury level will go up and down. So like rainy days like today will have a different pressure height than like sunny days, stuff like that. Um, a tor is the same as a millimeter of mercury, and tor is named after torricelli. So if you see a tor, it's the same as a millimeter of mercury. Problem set four will have millimeters of mercury and tor in them. So just realize they're the same, and they're both equal um, to uh, 760 of them equals an atmosphere. Now in the lab yesterday, or the lab you're going to do today or tomorrow, the little blue box that we use to read the pressure is recorded in what's called a millibar. And a millibar, uh, 1,013 millibars equals an atmosphere. That's because 1.013 bars equals a millibar. And there's jokes about chemists can't pass up a bar, and I'm not going to go there. However, just say no, kids. Uh, a millibar is another type of a unit of pressure. Now, because we live in the U.S. of A., a lot of times people will still use inches of mercury to record their pressure. And so if you want to record this not in millimeters or centimeters, but in inches, 29.9 inches of mercury is there. And a lot of times when you look at the weather forecast, they'll have different pressure readings, and it's, well, the barometer is 28.7. Well, that refers to inches of mercury. Um, Water is, of course, better to use environmentally and health-wise than mercury, but the reason why water isn't used as much is because the column of water would have to be about 34 feet tall. Water is a lot less dense than mercury, so the fluctuations are really great. Um, at Dartmouth, we used to have a barometer of water, and for super sensitive measurements, it was better because little tiny things, and you'd see a huge difference in water that you wouldn't see with the smaller mercury column. But on the other hand, it was a three-story building, and the people were always trying to read it. And it's awkward. So most of the time, people use mercury, even though it's funky. On the other hand, if you take physics, and a lot of times in engineering, Pascal is the official SI unit. SI units are things like meters and grams and seconds, the base units. So we really should be using Pascal, which is the simple big P sub A. Um, one atmosphere is 101.3.25 kilopascals, all right? This is another kind of an, uh, use of it and stuff. Uh, usually site chemists don't use the Pascal because as we're going to see the atmosphere is king. But if you take physics or a lot of engineering classes, the Pascal is really common. So again, lots of different types of units out there. The big ones for us are going to be these ones in red, not including Pascal, I'm just throwing it in there. So make sure that you know, <clears throat> memorize, 760 millimeters of mercury equals an atmosphere, a millimeter of mercury equals a tor, and in lab, this 1,013 millibar per atmosphere will also be useful too. Speaking of which, let's say that we have a nitrogen gas pressure of 452 millimeters of mercury, and we wish to express this in atmospheres. So again, this is just converting one type of unit into the other, and the punchline of this problem is that there are 760 millimeters of atmosphere in, or 760 millimeters of mercury, excuse me, in an atmosphere. So what you would do here is you would take 452 and divide by 760. If you wish to do the math, that's awesome. On the other hand, you convert this out 0.595 atmospheres. Um, we're back in the world of significant figures, conversion units, stuff like that. This is a three sig fig value for pressure, and the goal is to get a three sig fig answer out. So this conversion, one atmosphere per 760 millimeters of mercury, is an exact conversion. You don't have to worry about the significant figures here, stuff like that. Any questions? 
Uh, pressure changes as elevation changes, all right? And here's just some examples. If you're at sea level, roughly the pressure is about an atmosphere. But as you get higher and higher, then you begin to have less and less pressure. So Denver, the mile high city, is 0.83 atmospheres, roughly. This place in Bolivia is really high, 0.62. <coughs> and then you can see at Mount Everest, 0.35 atmospheres. So if you've ever watched the people climbing Everest, a lot of times they use those oxygen tanks because the pressure is so low. Um, Gresham is supposedly about 301 feet at City Hall. So it's about zero feet, which would be sea level. So usually Gresham's pressure is a little less than an atmosphere. But that being said, yesterday in lab, when if you recorded it, the pressure was actually a little bit more than an atmosphere. So this is just, these are just generalizations, all right? They're nothing to follow. As the storms come in and go away, the pressure changes and stuff, which is kind of cool. Boyle was the first one to start thinking about some of the relationships with pressure. And I, of course, totally dig his way. He looks like he's from Queen or something. But anyway, what Boyle did is he realized that if the quantity of gas, which is like moles N, and the temperature are constant, then the pressure and volume of the gas always equal a constant. So what that means is, as one of those quantities goes up, the other one goes down, and conversely. So if your pressure would go up, then the volume would go down. And of course, if the pressure went down, then the volume would go up. So sometimes people, what they'll do is they'll relate two conditions of pressure and volume equal to each other. So P1, V1, those would be like the initial pressure and initial volume. And that's going to equal P2, V2, the final pressure and volume. And if you know three of the four, you can solve for that fourth quantity. Sort of like in physics, the laws of momentum. Yes, that's right. That's right. Momentum and momentum. Oh, exactly. That's right. Well done. Pressure and volume are inversely related. Weight on the plunger of a sealed syringe increases the pressure on the air in the syringe. The air cannot escape, but its volume reduces under the pressure. So you can see here what they've got going. <coughs> Sorry. This is like the inverse of volume, and the more mass you have, it's like the more pressure, all right? And what they're seeing is that as you increase then the mass, there's a relationship to the volume. Now, if you try to plot just volume versus pressure, you don't get a straight line. And we're gonna see here coming up that having a straight line is a cool thing for science to base their mo scientists to base their models on. On the other hand, if you plot volume versus one over pressure, and you could do this, by the way, with pressure here and one over volume down there, then you do get a nice straight line. And straight lines mean predictable behaviors. We can start to predict what the volume's gonna be under a certain pressure, stuff like that. So the P1, V1 equals P2, V2 is sometimes called an inverse relationship because as one goes up, the other one goes down. And that's what this graph like kind of says here. Now, Charles is another person that was involved in this kind of process. <coughs> Charles, when he did his stuff with ballooning, he realized that if you keep the pressure of the gas constant and the quantity moles constant, then there's a relationship between the volume of the gas and the temperature of the gas. So you can see it's like V equals K times T. And if you kind of rearrange this a little bit, V over T is gonna equal a constant K. So what a lot of times people will do is they'll use V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, where again, the ones are like the initial conditions and the twos are like the second conditions. So if you know three of the four, you can then follow and find the fourth value. Temperature and volume are directly related. As heat is added to a sealed syringe, the volume of the air in the syringe increases. A plot of gas temperature and volume demonstrates that the relationship between them is linear. If we extrapolate the line down to a temperature of absolute zero, in principle, the gas has no volume. 
So this little part up here in red is uh, showing like a standard kind of set of conditions. And they're basically taking a syringe, which is relatively airtight, and they're heating the water around it. So with the heat here is like the temperature. And as the temperature goes up, then the pressure will go up. And of course, you could cool it down as well. Now, what's really interesting here, though, is that if you extrapolate, which means follow the data all the way back to absolute zero, you get to the place where you wouldn't have any, pre any volume whatsoever. And does it make sense that a gas with mass, by the way, that would have zero volume? No, right on. So we're going to run into some issues when we get down here at the zero Kelvin mark, and we'll talk about that more later. Also, notice that T is in the denominator, all right? What's going to happen if we would divide by, say, zero Celsius? Air. Calculators freak when you divide by zero, all right? And if you were to divide by a negative Celsius, you'd get negative volumes, which is weird. So Kelvin temperatures are going to be your go-to unit in this section because you can't divide by zero. You can't use negative Celsius temperatures. You can do things with pressure and volume. You can play around with those units. But when it comes to temperature, man, in this section, use Kelvin temperatures all the time. All right, fake. We're going to talk about R a little bit. It's the gas constant we used yesterday. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Yeah. <coughs> Where was the uh, K? Not like the K for Kelvin, but the other K. The K is just a constant. It's like the slope of this line. All right. Anytime you have a straight line, you're going to have like a slope. And so it depends on the type of gas you've got, right. but it's just always going to be a constant. We'll come back to the R thing that Faith talked about earlier and see how this all comes to Good questions. Other questions? You can do some fun things with Charles Law. <clears throat> liquid nitrogen is somewhat readily available. And liquid nitrogen, uh, the liquid form, it doesn't turn into a gas until minus 196 Celsius. So very, very cold. And so if you place like a balloon in liquid nitrogen, it shrinks way down. The, the gas inside the balloon, uh, the volume goes way, 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 way down, and you end up with this kind of shriveled thing. On the other hand, if you take the shriveled balloon and you let it sit at room temperature again, then as temperature goes up, your volume goes up, it returns back to its original state. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. So fun being operative. Anyway. Here is a possible kind of a problem that you might see. And this shows then uh, how some of these things work out. We've got a gas, and at 25 degrees Celsius, room temperature, we have a volume of 235 milliliters. And the question here is, what would be the temperature of the same gas if you had a volume of 310 milliliters? And we're not changing the pressure, and we're not changing the amount. And if you wish to go through this calculation, that's cool. But on the other hand, I want to talk about some of the dynamics here. Remember that temperatures in these equations have to be in Kelvin. So the first thing you'd want to do, and what I would do, is turn 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin. What would you add to that number to get Kelvin? Good, 273.15, that's right. 273.15 plus 25 will give you the Kelvin temperature. So if you put this into V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, you would solve for T2, and the initial temperature is going to come out in Kelvin. And none of these temperatures here are in Kelvin. So a lot of times on these problems, then you have to take the answer and subtract the 273.15 again to get the Celsius temperature. If you do this, it comes out to be 120 degrees Celsius. So you can see that here's 25 Celsius turned into Kelvin, 298. We're solving here for T2, all right? T2 is V2, T1 divided by V1. The answer comes out in Kelvin, 393, but don't, don't be fooled, all right? This is Kelvin, it's not Celsius yet. If you turn it back into Celsius, 120 degrees Celsius. What does that little dot right there by the 120 mean? Sig figs, yeah, we're back in the world of sig figs. 
So this is a three sig fig number. And do notice that we went from a two sig fig temperature to a three sig fig answer. This happens a lot when you add and subtract numbers when, in science. So adding 25 to 273, you end up with a three sig fig temperature. <coughs> And this temperature converted back into Celsius still got three sig figs. Yeah. Um, so we don't have to convert milliliters into liters? Correct. Um, we're going to see that when we get to the R that Faith asked about, then we have to use liters all the time. But this one, you can actually kind of, in my opinion, cheese out, which is a good thing, and leave it in milliliters right on. Both pressure and volume, unless you use the R that we'll talk about in a little bit, you can use other types of units, Nisha. Excellent observation. Other questions? Avogadro actually got his value for, well he didn't, he proposed the value for Avogadro's number based on his study of gases. And in a nutshell, he thought, hey, if I have a balloon with X molecules and I double the volume of the balloon, I should have double the amount of molecules. So Avogadro's hypothesis, <coughs> excuse me, is basically saying that volume is proportional to the quantity N. And again, there's that R that Faith talked about. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But for right now, focus on the idea about volume and quantity. So as the moles is doubled, the volume should double. And if you would take half of the moles, half of them, and would go down to half, then your volume would go down to one half as well. Now do realize that doubling volume will not make more gas, more quantity, all right? It only works if you double or have the amount. So making extra volume would not affect the moles. It could affect other things, we'll see, uh, which is kind of interesting. A lot of times people will abbreviate this as V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And again, N here is moles in quantity. Quantity and volume are directly related. If we take eight molecules of H2 and combine them with four molecules of O2, we get 12 molecules and a combined volume. If we then react the mixture, we end up with eight molecules of gaseous H2O, which occupies the same volume as eight molecules of any other gas. When you form water, it's two hydrogens and one oxygen to make two waters. And notice here how one oxygen versus two hydrogens, even though the molar masses are different, this is all about moles now. So this would be twice as many moles. You could take both of these numbers and divide by Avogadro's to get the moles, but it's twice as many moles here. So the volume is twice as large. And initially, before they were allowed to react, there was a little picture here with 12 molecules, and that was the biggest circle of all. But when they react and make the water molecules, the stoichiometry, the big numbers in front, the stoichiometry is two to two. So the size of this volume should be the same as the size of this volume right here. Um, this is another way to see it. Here's like one mole of helium and two moles of helium. And the volume here should be half of this one or this volume is twice as much as this one. So this is what the Avogadro's part's all about. But really all of these things are secondary to us re relative to what's called the ideal gas law. And this is where this part- A bicycle pump forces air into the confined space of the tire. As more air is added to the tire, the pressure increases. The tire's volume increases slightly, and the air becomes warmer. These observations are predictable properties of gases, and, as we explore in this chapter, they are described by the gas laws. If you pump up your tire, you're actually changing all these things in here, like you're changing the pressure in the tire, the volume will probably compensate, you're increasing the amount of gas going into the tire, which is moles, and there can, there's definitely probably going to be a temperature change. So to correlate all these effects into one, you end up with this equation here, the ideal gas law. And this is the R that uh, I had earlier that Faith saw, and this will talk about what exactly R is. 
So the ideal gas law is a real powerhouse of chemistry, and it's just a way to relate pressure and volume to quantity and moles and temperature Kelvin. But along the way, we do need to use what's called the gas constant. And 0 0.082057, this is what they call the gas version or the gas the gas version of the gas constant. And this is a number we're going to use quite a bit in this section. Anytime you have the pressure of a gas and a volume and a temperature, you're going to see some changes. So the R value here comes in, comes in really handy. Um, liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin are the units of this R. And what that means is that if you use R, you must use liters for volume, atmospheres for pressure, moles for quantity, and Kelvin temperatures. Now earlier, Alicia saw, which was awesome, that we, we could use milliliters, all right? If you don't use R, then you can use milliliters for volume. You can actually use other kinds of pressure units too. But if you use R, you've got to use all of these. And again, use Kelvin temperatures regardless. Um, we're going to see this R constant later, not this chapter, but later. I'm going to call that the energy R to differentiate it from the gas R, which is this one. And you might see other kinds of units in other classes too. Dimitri? Um, why is it called the ideal gas law? We'll talk about that too. Coming up. Other questions? I, in a nutshell, Dimitri, this works 99% of the time, but there are some places where it doesn't, and we'll talk about that at the end. So it's ideal, but works more often than not. Here's an example. Let's say we want to fill a small room with nitrogen gas, and our room has a volume of 960 cubic feet. Ugh, feet. Anyway, let's try and get the use the SI unit. This is the value of the room in liters, all right? And liters is what we need for the ideal gas law. We also want to fill the gas uh, in the room to this pressure and the temperature of the room, 25 degrees Celsius. So we can do all of this using the ideal gas law. If it's asking for quantity, quantity is like moles, N. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve for the moles of nitrogen gas. That will be our first thing, and then we could go to grams or kilograms, stuff like that. And again, along the way, we're gonna need this R number. Um, because R is in liters, atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin, we've gotta get everything into these units. So the volume is okay as is, it's already in liters, but the pressure now we need to convert over into atmospheres. So we saw earlier 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere. When you convert that over 0 0.980 atmospheres, we've also got to convert temperatures into Kelvin. And again, this entire chapter, using R or not, you've got to use Kelvin temperatures. So 298 Kelvin would be the temperature of this room. And now that we've got a liters and a Kelvin and an atmosphere, we can plug it in up here and we're gonna solve for N. And again, R, the R constant there is gonna be the thing we'll use too. So N is PV over RT. Here is the pressure in atmospheres. Here's the volume in liters. Here's our gas constant. And here's the temperature. And again, it's R that's dictating the units we have to use here. So we've got to use liters to make those cancel out, and the pressure, and the temperature, and Kelvin. Anyway, the only thing that's left then is moles. So initially, you end up with 1.08 times 10 to the third moles of N2, and you can turn this into grams and kilograms from there. <clears throat> Any questions? Cool. That's like... Of molecules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In my world, everything has a ton of molecules, you know, but, but literally a ton, yeah, that would be like uh, 2,000 pounds, whatever. I don't know how that quality. Yeah, that's right. Here's another possible application of how this stuff works out. Um, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. And it's usually kept in a brown bottle in the refrigerator because
because the H2O2 does break down into water and, gas, and oxygen gas. <coughs> Notice that the hydrogen peroxide is a liquid and these two are both gases. So if we wish to intentionally break apart 1.1 grams of hydrogen peroxide, and we're gonna do it in a flask of 2.50 liters, we can actually then calculate what the pressure of the O2 gas is gonna be, and what the pressure of the water vapor is gonna be. Now water can be a whole bunch of different phases. This one here, of course, is a gas. Ideal gas law, probably not too surprising. We're gonna figure out the pressure of the water vapor and the pressure of the oxygen gas. And what we'll do is use that PV equals NRT thing. Um, this is actually something that's used in biology. This beetle thing apparently sprays uh, things in some kind of system to defend itself, and it's the spray comes from the decomposition of hydrogen <coughs> peroxide. I don't know very much about biology, but I'll trust them that this is the process they use. Um, anytime you have a lot of gases, you have a lot of pressure, and the pressure is what allows things to be sprayed. All right, so what you wanna do is first you gotta get things in units. Um, also, this is a balanced reaction, and in a balanced reaction, we can use the relationship between hydrogen peroxide and oxygen or water to do it. And what I mean by that, this is two moles of H2O2 that are breaking down, and that will create two moles of water and one mole of O2. So if we can turn the grams of H2O2 into moles, we can then use these molar relationships to convert into moles of water or moles of oxygen. Once we have the moles of water or oxygen, we can use the PV equals NRT to find the corresponding pressure. Because we've got the R, that's the 0 0.082057 number. This is the Kelvin temperature, right? So we can turn Celsius into Kelvin. And we even have the flask volume, which is, which is already in liters. The pressure that comes out will be in units of atmosphere. We're using R, so we're gonna use all the R values. And R has an atmosphere value. So again, this is stuff that you've all done before, but maybe it's been a while. We need to turn the grams of hydrogen peroxide into moles of hydrogen peroxide. And this number right here is the molar mass of H2O2. And to get this number, the periodic table is our guide. Oxygen is about 16 grams per mole, and there's two of them in H2O2. So 16 times two plus hydrogen, which is about one gram per mole, times two of those. So 16 times two plus one times two is 34 grams per mole. And you can do a better job if you want stuff uh, on the periodic table, but that's kind of how you find these numbers. And all of those numbers are ways to relate the mass in grams to the moles. So we have 0 0.032 moles of hydrogen peroxide here. Questions on that? Okay. Um, you can convert to moles of oxygen or moles of water. I'll convert to oxygen first. So in this process, this equation says two moles of H2O2 per one mole of O2. That's what the balanced equation is all about. So this part right here, the stoichiometric factor, is literally just using the numbers again from the balanced reaction. So for every 0 0.032 moles of H2O2, you can multiply by one over two, and you'll have 0 0.016 moles of oxygen. And again, you could do water first here. I'm just doing oxygen first. Once you have the moles of oxygen, you can use the P equals NRT over the ideal gas law to find the pressure. So these are the moles of oxygen. Our good old R constant, once again, the temperature in Kelvin, and the volume of the flask. So P equals NRT over V. Throw all this together, 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen pressure will be created. Questions? Prof. off. if any of this is looking a little fuzzy, all right, 
don't, don't be afraid to reach out because we're going back to some things in Chem 221. That was so last year, 2019 for some of you, and maybe even earlier than that, right? So don't uh, don't be worried if they're like, oh man, Muller Bass freaking me out. Uh, give me like two minutes in my office or in you know some thing, and we'll take care of it. All right. <clears throat> the pressure of water is also a good thing to figure out here too, because we've got oxygen. We should also figure out the pressure of water. Now, we could go back and do the whole thing we did before. Grams of H2O2 to moles of H2O2. It would use a 2 to 2 ratio of H2O2 water. And from there, we could find the pressure. But there's a little hint you can do here. Because according to Avogadro's hypothesis, one mole of gas has such a volume, and two moles of gas would have twice the volume. But it also works for pressure. If your volume is constant, you can also do the same kind of thing with pressure. So what that means is that in this case of oxygen, we had 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen created. And water is twice the stoichiometry, two waters for every one oxygen. So in addition to volume, this works really well for pressure as well. So you can use uh, moles to volume if temperature and pressure is constant. You can also do pressure from moles as long as volume and temperature are constant. And in this case, you've got one flask. That flask isn't fluctuating, one volume. So that means the pressure here is going to change. The pressure will be twice as much as the oxygen pressure was because of this two to one ratio. And this is a nice way to save yourself some time sometimes. You can then sometimes use Avogadro's hypothesis to figure this stuff out. If you don't trust me and you don't have to, I won't be offended, go through the math, all right? Go grams to moles, H2O2, two to two relationship, H2O2 to water, and then find the pressure from there. You should see it's the same thing. Now, around us all the time are a whole bunch of gases. So what there's something called Dalton's Law of Pressures, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. And it just means to find the total pressure of a system, you add up the individual gases. Gases usually coexist pretty well with each other, all right? Um, so in this case, the total pressure in the flask would be the 0.32 atmospheres of water plus the 0.16 atmospheres of oxygen for a total of 0.48 atmospheres. Um, this is a really interesting thing that happens with gases. Here are three random gases. The first one is 300 kilopascals, which is a type of pressure. This one is 600 and this one is 450. And if you add up those three numbers, you get 1350. The total pressure is the sum of the individual pressures. And this is really important to us here as humans because the air we're breathing right now is really only about 20% oxygen. Most of it is nitrogen. There's also some water, a little argon, stuff like that in there. So we're breathing not pure oxygen, but a mixture of gases. And you can use Dalton's Law to figure out like how much oxygen there is, how much nitrogen there is, stuff like that. Um, here's an example of how this thing can work out. <clears throat> Uh, here's an example. We've got some B2H6. This thing is called diborane, and you don't need to worry about that. Diborane is a gas, and it reacts with oxygen and gas to make this uh, boric oxide stuff, which we don't care about, and some water. All right. What I'd like you to see here, though, is that you have a solid boric oxide and gaseous water. All right. <clears throat> the total pressure of the reactant mixture, this stuff over here, 200 millimeters of mercury. And what it's saying then is what's the partial pressure of the reactant gases? So in this problem, we don't really care about the products at all here, but you do want to focus on, first of all, that the total pressure is 200 millimeters of mercury, and also focus on the fact that you have a 1 to 3 ratio of diboring to oxygen, all right? So if moles are proportional to pressure, which is the thing we just went through, how many total moles of reactant do we have here? 
We have one mole of diborane. How many moles of oxygen? Three. So there's a total of four moles of reactant gases, all right? And <clears throat> assuming that this is stoichiometrically ratio, which means they have exactly one mole of diborane for every three moles of oxygen, that four is going to be important because if this is the total pressure, all right, then 200 divided by four, divided by making, finding out one fourth, that's going to be the pressure of the diborane. So one fourth of 200 is going to be the pressure of B2H6. And three fourths of this number is going to be the oxygen. So I want to highlight there what I did. Ignore all of that. Focus on just this. Three moles of oxygen and one mole of diborane are four moles total. And if, that's, if this is all stoichiometric, which means you have just the right amounts, then of the four moles, one fourth of it is gonna be this pressure, and three fourths of this is gonna be the other one. So you're gonna end up with 50 millimeters of, B, of mercury, a B2H6, one fourth of the 200. And three fourths of 200, or 150, is gonna be the pressure of the oxygen. This is a handy thing sometimes. Pressure and moles are proportional. So you can use the balanced reaction then to figure out partial pressures of reactants, in this case, or partial pressures of products. Questions? Clarify, uh -huh. you did the reactant because it says to do it in a question. It's the total pressure of the yeah. reactant mixture. That's right. Um, Joseph, a common type of question like this is you have a solid reactant and it makes like one gas reactant and three gas or one uh, gas product and and three moles of another gas product so that would be another way to get your four it would just be then for products instead of reactants good there's another really important equation bromine vapor is roughly five times more dense than air It can be poured from one flask to another. <clears throat> the density of bromine, like that of all gases, is directly proportional to the molecular mass of its molecules in the gas phase. Notice how you pour the bromine. All right, so this tank over here, it even sounds different when we fill it up. So here, listen to this, it sounds different. Heavy. But if you feel this, it, is, it feels heavy too. Just move the drop this back and forth and fill it. Oh, yeah. So this it's is like a tiny water. Yeah. Like it's got water in it. It's got weight. And it's just gas. All right, so the same thing you're going to do, but uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to exit. Uh, all your air goes out, and then breathe in, and then I want you to do the intro to the podcast. Ready? Just keep telling our, okay. our listeners at home uh, something of importance. Ready? And there we go. He's bringing in the air. Right? Right into his lungs. You know, you can do that with some sort of but you're really doing that. You're not doing there's no trick behind the scenes or audio production. Is that it's still in your lungs, isn't it? It's still in your lungs, but it's still you know. Okay, now breathe in. You know, push it back out again. You're gonna to have to do that a couple times because that's the other gas. Almost there. Almost there. Okay. One more. There. Okay. There it is. Hello, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Did I make it back? gases have a much different density. Um, things that are more dense than air actually sink to the ground. So you can see them actually pouring out the SF6. 
On the other hand, it also affects your um, vocal cords. If you do helium, you sound kind of like a chipmunk. SF6 and the heavier gases, you end up sounding like a deeper thing, which is cool. Um, the other equation, which is really important, comes from PV equals NRT. And if you rearrange this a little bit, you get N over V equals P over RT. Um, moles is equal to mass divided by the molar mass. So grams divided by grams per mole gives you moles. And if you rearrange this a little bit, M over V, the little M over V, that's density. So sometimes people will write this as D equals PM over RT, or what we're gonna to refer to it as PM equals DRT. This is the so-called evening dirt equation. And it's a nice way to relate the density of a gas to the molar mass of the gas. We're using a variety of this in our lab this week. But when I refer to the evening dirt, evening is like PM, not AM, okay? And dirt without the I is DRT. It's kind of a good thing. We'll see you can do some pretty cool things with this. All right, I'm out of time. We'll do more of this on Friday. Have a wonderful day.